Well, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. A uh, slightly different um, environment to the one uh, in which I spent uh, quite a few weeks of my life up in the district court uh, in Hastings. Um, it's uh, important that I acknowledge um, Minister Mahuta for the leadership that she is showing uh, through the work of the Three Waters Review uh, and the uh, other ministries that uh, are supporting that work. Um, Minister Mahuta was one of the four ministers uh, to whom uh, the inquiry panel provided the report in December last year and uh, we have um, had ongoing discussions uh, with uh, those ministers and um, we're watching with great interest uh, as the Three Waters Review uh, has taken shape and the further work that is being undertaken. And it is encouraging that in the background papers to the various work streams for the ongoing Three Waters Review uh, that they noted consistency with the findings of the inquiry. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Labour Government New Zealand, uh, Water New Zealand and the Institute for putting on this summit. It's a wonderful opportunity to um, talk about a very important subject. And my focus, of course, will be on uh, drinking water. Um, I was in a legal conference in Montreal. It was held at the Laurentian Hotel. The venue was a little bit like this. Um, on the first morning, we went down to breakfast and there was a Frenchman um, at the uh, table. And before he started eating, he said, uh, bon appetit. And there was a representative from Texas. He stood up, held out his hand and said, Ralph Murdoch. <laughs> I was at the same table at lunchtime and the same thing happened again. And that afternoon, the uh, Texan was quite curious and he was heard to ask, why do French people introduce themselves at mealtime? <laughs> and the other um, Delegate said, well, look, it's a matter of French politeness and courtesy, and why don't you try it? So that night at dinner, he um, stood up and said, Bon appetit! And the Frenchman got up and said, Ralph Murdoch. <laughs> so, um, with that little introduction, um, I do want to get back to the serious uh, business of the outbreak in Havelock North. Um, it was, uh, by any measure, uh, a very serious um, outcome. As the slide explains, four people died, uh, 45 were hospitalised, 5,500 residents became ill with campylobacteriosis, and an unknown number continue to suffer health complications, some of which are very serious indeed. Um, the outbreak was traced to two bores in Brookvale Road and the event raised major concerns about the safety and security of New Zealand's drinking water system uh, as a whole. Um, that contamination um, occurred following a major weather event in the first week of August 2016. The cause uh, was the Campylobacter bacterium. Sheep feces were the source of the Campylobacter. Heavy rain and flooding carried the feces from nearby fields, contamin contamin contaminating the Mangateri Terry stream. A pond in the uh, stream drained into the aquifer. Brookvale bores one and two extracted water from the aquifer and contaminated the water supply, and the water supply had no treatment barriers in place. Um, that is um, a, a slide of the uh, Mangateri Terry stream. Uh, the fields of which I spoke are <coughs> in the background, and to the 
um, right hand side of the slide as you look at it, Brookvale Road is, runs along the front of the slide. Um, there is a Brookvale bore number three, about 500 metres or so, 400 metres down the road. Uh, that, I understand, is still operating, but um, through the work of the Hastings District Council and the Joint Water Group, uh, treatment uh, has been introduced for water coming out of that bore. But that's just to ground the discussion um, about which we're speaking. And I've just put on that slide um, a reference to the uh, proceedings of the inquiry. All of the evidence, all of the transcripts of the hearings, uh, all of the applications, all of the uh, issues, papers that we prepared, uh, and the two reports are available on that website. And that will, in time, perhaps be a very important record. Um, the context for the work in, was divided into two parts, the initial uh, determination of the cause, and I've set out on that slide the key findings from stage one, which are set out uh, on, the, uh, on the slide. Uh, and we found that the Hawke's Bay Regional Council had failed to meet responsibilities. Uh, similarly, the um, Hastings District Council failed to meet necessary standards. Um, consultants and officials from uh, both councils failed to assess drinking water supply risks ac uh, accurately. And risk is a topic about which I'm going to speak uh, today. Uh, the drinking water assessors from the DHB and the Ministry of Health took a hands-off approach to regulation. And relationships, um, sadly, when we first began the inquiry, uh, were dysfunctional. And I did want to um, refer to a quote by Dr. Haruti, who was one of the witnesses. Um, in our second report, we said that an important lesson from Havelock North uh, was that relying on source protection as the only major barrier exposes a supply to unacceptable risk. So if that's all that's in place, source protection, that is totally unacceptable. Dr. Harudi um, addressed uh, a New Zealand conference subsequently and said multiple barriers means more than one barrier. An obvious statement that needs to be made given what was allowed to happen in Havelock North. He also said that reliance on unverified, demonstrably questionable and possibly unverifiable classification as secure groundwater is the only barrier for ensuring safe drinking water should be recognised as seriously inadequate. And he added, with the benefit of hindsight, in Havelock North, it was reckless. So, with that, and I'm sorry that it's such a short summary, but it has to be because um, I'm here to talk about the stage two recommendations and put the discussions that we're going to have over this two days in context. Um, the stage two uh, required the inquiry to look at any necessary legal and regulatory changes changes required to operating practices and any other matters that might promote safe drinking water or prevent similar uh, incidents happening again. And you can see the large numbers of issues that we looked at. Importantly, the um, stage two report contains 51 recommendations, about 12 of which we found required urgent and early attention and I'll talk about some of those um, in a moment. Um, a critical work of the inquiry in part two was an analysis of risks. And the topic of risk uh, is written up in part three of the second report. So if you haven't read it, I warmly commend you to, to go on that website, print out a copy of part three, and read it. 
the inquiry um, identified a number of known and unknowable risks around drinking water delivery and difficulties in controlling such risks. And it found that the difficulties are likely to increase with climate change, intensification of farming, population growth, and urban sprawl. And I note that those findings are consistent with the work that the uh, Department of Internal Affairs officials have been doing in preparation for the uh, current work for three quarters. Now, turning to the general risk landscape, um, appreciating the nature of the relevant risks is fundamental to understanding the uh, operative regulatory system and the roles of the people that are involved <coughs> in it. Waterborne disease outbreaks often arise following some change in circumstances, termed events, and typically these include uh, flooding or heavy rain, droughts, power failures, organisational factors such as complacency or inadequate resourcing. And in terms of our findings, we said that such failures may occur at any time, may occur slowly over time without red, red flags being raised, and they cannot be detected necessarily. The safety of a supply or security of a source can never be assumed to remain static, even where at one point of time reasonable confidence exists. So what your source is today may be quite different from what it is an hour later or tomorrow. And so evidence of supply safety under baseline or normal conditions is no guarantee that this safety will be maintained <coughs> under event or other challenging conditions. Now, the inquiry um, examined a range of the risks to groundwater sources, and a key finding was that changes to the aquifer and surrounding hydrology can occur, ores can be placed into the aquifer, and the aquitard can be um, compromised. And there were a number of examples of this in the Hemlock North context. And so I've just put up a slide there about the permeability of aquifers and aquitards. And I should emphasize that all of these findings, including the one on, on the board about the impact of earthquakes, um, earth and ocean tide loadings, and the other variables that operate around the hydrology were supported by expert evidence before the inquiry was very interesting. We used a system of panels and brought in uh, experts from New Zealand and including international experts. And it's surprising how often the views of the expert panel uh, were at one. So there were not many areas where there was a, a wide variation of view. And so what I'm putting up here by way of findings of our inquiry are uh, all backed up by the expert and other evidence that we heard during the evidence phases of the inquiry. We found that major risks included earthquakes, and that's highly relevant for many parts of New Zealand um, because of our geographic lines and the faults that operate in our um, environment. Bores and penetrations of aquitards and aquifers, and there was a classic example on Brookvale Road itself, down at bore number three, and the aquitard had been compromised a short distance from bore number three, uh, and the um, inquiry looked at evidence surrounding the uh, earthworks that had been done at tomato mushrooms and that that had undoubtedly compromised the aquifer and the aquitard in uh, those areas. Additional risks to source water um, include 
are both natural and human factors. So natural factors, wildlife, climate, topography, geology, and vegetation. And you saw the photograph at the front of the Mama Terry Terry Street, and that is exactly what it looked like um, at the time. Interestingly, it went up and down depending on the, the weather, but in flood conditions, of course, it was right up to the road level and the flood went over the road and um, uh, very, very close to where Bores number one and number two were. Um, proximity of assets um, of uh, wastewater and stormwater um, were exemplified in the Christchurch earthquake. Um, Waiheke School was another example in May of 2017. And asset proximity was also described in the evidence of Dr. Dare, uh, an international expert who said he was shocked by the proximity of drinking water assets with uh, wastewater assets. He said he's just never seen anything in, uh, except in the third world. So it was quite um, significant evidence. Um, we also took into consideration risks from illegal, unconsented, or inadequately consented activities in the kitchen. And this is where I'm sure uh, those of you with regional councils uh, will have particular um, interests. And um, we, we looked, for example, at illegal earthworks or connections, discharges of nitrates upstream of collection areas and into water sources, just by way of a few examples. Landfills was another uh, area. We have a, quite a number of landfills in New Zealand. Some have been, been well done, others have not been well done, and they serve as a potential hazard um, to water sources. Now, in terms of the human factor, um, evidence from Dr. Harudi spoke of, of complacency. In all of the academic material, a lot of the expert evidence emphasised that complacency uh, is, is um, often present. In other words, uh, people are not having their eye on the ball. And of course, in um, Havelock North, there'd been an incident with these two same bores in 1998, which is written up in the first um, report. And that leads on to the discussion in the report about risk management and the importance of multiple barriers. So we received um, a lot of evidence about the association between waterborne outbreaks and severe weather events, and of course we seem to be having more and more of those uh, in New Zealand with climate change and other climactic factors that um, are occurring here. Um, and we also noted, and this is evident in the second quote, the, the vulnerability of aquifers from bores and casings and the risks that arise there. Because they're under the ground, it's very, very difficult to uh, monitor how those assets are wearing. They're um, quite, there's a lot of technical uh, difficulty around determining how um, uh, secure they are, and that is written up in part 20 of the report. And so, by way of um, conclusions uh, on, on risk, uh, we found that even though the probability of a particular risk may be low, if the consequences are high, then the risk must either be eliminated or mitigated and monitored. And of course, we all know that we're operating was drinking water in the public health space. So the nature of the high consequence of risk materialising was very clearly borne out in Havelock North with the four deaths, the 45 hospitalisations and the significant portion of the population that were became, that became sick. And so 
Um, I've noted in the second quote that risks to the New Zealand drinking water supply are many, very real and ubiquitous. And the report talks about the nature of those risks. And I think a key finding is in paragraph 150 um, that not all water suppliers have an adequate appreciation of the levels of risk, particularly the risk of future changes. So to say we're fine now, there's nothing wrong today, is not good enough. And that's why the monitoring and sampling and laboratories part of the report um, is, is just as important as some of the material that I'm not talking about uh, today. Now I'd like to just very briefly draw your attention to a couple of quite startling uh, charts. There's one in Appendix 7 in the Stage 1 report. Over a 10-year period prior to Havelock North, there were 13 re recorded waterborne outbreaks. So we have a bad history. And I went back to that schedule this morning and counted between 1985 and 2016, there were 45 outbreaks in New Zealand over 30 years. So that's more than one a year. Fortunately, none, none of them were as bad as Havelock North, but that may, be, may have been serendipitous. The other appendix to which I draw your attention, and it really does repay study because it's sobering, is appendix four of the stage two report, which contains a schedule of media reported drinking water quality issues in New Zealand. So over the time that the inquiry was sitting, there were no less than 50 entries um, up to the 17th of November 2017. So these are transgressions that are being reported, findings of E. coli in storage um, uh, tanks for water, in the water articulation, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, it's not just the major outbreaks that we need to be concerned with. Um, a significant amount of waterborne disease burden arises not from significant outbreaks such as Havelock North. Um, and we did have some independent work done on that. And it's estimated that, and I know the variance is large, but up to 100,000 people become ill um, from waterborne disease uh, from consuming water every year and the, the costs, the health costs, are considerable. And those, again, those findings were supported by research that was carried out and evidence produced to the inquiry. Now, just to set all of that in context, and it may explain why we have such a poor history, is the compliance levels with the drinking water standards. The former Director General, Mr. Chua, uh, in evidence, he came along and gave evidence, said that the non-compliance figures were very troubling, unacceptable for those living in the affected communities. And for the smaller suppliers, he described compliance as woeful and worrying. And we went through the um, annual reports put out by the Ministry of Health, and the number of suppliers that had crosses in their column uh, regarding compliance was surprising. And we looked at um, all of the figures from these annual reports, and it showed that over 750,000 people in New Zealand were supplied with water that is not demonstrably safe. And the figures I've set out, the risks arising from bacterial infection, protozoal infection, and risk from the long-term effects of exposure by chemicals. Now the inquiry found disturbing levels of non-compliance, uh, and it got worse 
the, the smaller the supplier. But even at the top level, with major suppliers, it was well below international standards. And I've uh, put up some of the more startling quotes from the uh, report, but perhaps the most graphic description is this chart. It's, it's the only once has compliance with the drinking water standards got over 90% and that was back in 2010. It's under 90%, and this is for major suppliers. They're not complying, many of them are not complying with the drinking water standards. Now, look what happens when you go to the medium suppliers. Look what happens when you go to the minor suppliers. And of course, it's not just the 500 or 5,000 people that are being affected, it's the visitors, the tourists, and everyone that passes through that area that are being exposed. And if you go to small, um, and one is, example, I don't know if there's anyone here from Puna I think they have 270 residents. Um, and I think they're on, certainly the evidence before the inquiry was that they're on permanent oil water numbers. But they have masses of tourists going through. So it's really troubling. And that's, those are the figures for small supplies. And if you put the chart together, you can see that it's um, not very good reading. And that is um, why, of course, uh, we heard so much evidence about oil water notices being in place. Um, at 44 supply zones had issued oil water notices in 2015-16. Uh, 26 are permanent for some over 7,000 people and 18 are temporary for over 8,000 people. And of course, we were asked to make a comparisons with uh, international compliance with relevant drinking water standards. And in England and Wales and large Finnish supplies, Scottish water, they've all had greater than 99%. So that's where we as an industry should be aiming. England and Wales, and I'm here, you're sure you'll hear from uh, Marcus Ring later on, um, had virtually no issues with protozoa during the same period. And it's true um, that for smaller and private suppliers, uh, there are still issues, but I su suggest that our figures are shocking. Now, the inquiry concluded that New Zealand had low levels of compliance with the drinking water standards. And of course, those standards, we also found in another part of the report, are not fit for purpose. They are not up to World Health Organization standards. And our drinking water, so the poor compliance is with poorly suited standards. And part 22 of the second report um, suggests significant changes required to the drinking water standards, and I understand that work is underway by um, the Ministry of Health uh, on that. Now, I said 51 recommendations, and there were some 12 early and urgent recommendations. Um, one of those was universal treatment, and I've put the recommendation up on the um, slide. And it was pleasing to see this recommendation drew an immediate response from the then Director General of Health. On the 20th of December 2017, uh, two weeks post delivery of our report, Mr. Chua uh, issued a statement under the Health Act, which I put up on the board. And I'm sorry the writing is small, but um, if you have a chance to look at the slides later on, look at the bullet points because he emphasizes the importance of source protection and he emphasizes the fact that risks are increased if water is untreated. And um, that was a, a letter made under the auspices of the 
um, Health Act. And we also recommended that the DHBs, through the drinking water assessors, get the message out there that water needs to be treated. Now, following the Stage 2 report, a number of water suppliers, large and small, have commissioned reports on the state of their water delivery infrastructure assets. And by naming just a few names that I've picked up anecdotally, I'm sure there'll be others, and don't feel um, that I'm missing you out deliberately if I haven't included your council in the list. But those are just some of the positive steps that are being taken. And with, for example, Napier, it's interesting, they had a number of the ally transgressions um, actually during the course of the uh, inquiry. And I understand that they have now, now joined the joint working group uh, that operates, I believe, very effectively. Certainly that was the evidence that we heard um, in uh, Hawke's Bay. And um, the other pleasing um, development is that other councils have already introduced um, treatment barriers, including uh, chlorination. So um, then to the inquiry recommendation nine, the establishment of a dedicated um, drinking water regulator and minister, I was uh, interested that you referred to that recommendation. Uh, and we've noted that it is uh, still under active consideration by government. Um, we also um, mentioned in recommendation 12, the possibility of uh, pending legislative change, and we appreciate that some of the changes are going to require legislative change and will not be straightforward. But in the meantime, perhaps some unit uh, could be, a governance unit could be set up to address matters, um, for example, of the early emergent. Um, how much progress is being made in those early and urgents? And we um, emphasise the importance of maintaining momentum, uh, facilitating the establishment of a drinking water regulator, and facilitating the handover to that regulator in whatever uh, guise uh, may eventually appear. And we, again, we appreciate that government is considering that recommendation. Now, the last one that I'll deal with, and it's not to belittle any of the other recommendations, but I just had to pick a few. Um, the recommendation about creating dedicated and aggregated drinking water supplies. And again, Minister, I was delighted that you picked up on that recommendation. And because there is a compelling case for dedicated and aggregated suppliers being established as an effective and affordable means to improve compliance, competence, and accountability. Now, I'm not going to talk today about the, the demonstrated benefits. You can read them in the report, and they're on the slide. But many water suppliers, particularly the smaller ones, could access some of these benefits by working together with neighbourhood, their neighbours. And it may be too much to hope that voluntary aggregation might just start to occur. But the case for it is well made on the evidence that we heard in the inquiry. And we also were um, informed that in Scotland there's one drinking water supplier for 4,000 people one regulator and the tax system is working well. And the summit will hear from a representative of Taswater from Tasmania where reform was found to be necessary and regulation has occurred. And so I conclude by emphasising that capturing some of these available gains uh, from aggregation would surely be benefit to smaller suppliers in the meantime. And the, the buying opportunities. I know that budgets are being done at the moment and money funding is being allocated for plant and infrastructure and treatment plants. How good would it be if you could combine and go overseas and make your purchases of treatment facilities if you're buying in bulk instead of 
individual suppliers going off and doing it on their own. So on that hopefully encouraging note, I conclude and thank you all very much for your attention.